What a great thrill it is to be here. It's really one of the most beautiful places in the country right now, and that's saying a lot coming from New Hampshire and Vermont, which is pretty beautiful. But it was really kind of had a certain kind of golden glow today. Uh, it's a treat for me to be here in part because one of my heroes, uh, who uh, you all think of as just another person hanging around campus, but Luis Chaula has uh, been my, one of my heroes uh, for the last 40 years. Uh, and so I always consider it a treat when I get to be in her presence. And so thanks to the university and to Thorne for uh, giving, me the, giving me this opportunity. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the Children, Youth, and the Environments uh, publication, it really is one of the leading journals in terms of this whole relationship between children and the, and the natural and built environments. And it's, uh, it's uh, easier to overlook it now that it doesn't actually exist tangibly and only exists electronically, but it is really a wonderful publication. Uh, so I'm going to talk about place-based education, and I'm going to talk about a lot about some of the research that we've been trying to orchestrate uh, over the last decade or so to, to validate it. Uh, but before we get to the researchy thing, I want to kind of share you know, what it is and uh, get us all on the same page so everybody understands what I mean when I'm referring to place-based education. So I'm going to start with uh, two stories. Um, that illustrate the lack of place-based education. Uh, and so one of them uh, happened at my local elementary school. Uh, I live in Harrisville, New Hampshire, southwestern New Hampshire, near Mount Monadnock. And uh, the first and second grade teacher is, te is doing a unit on the solar system with her first and second graders. And she's a graduate of my teacher education program. And I go to her and I say, Emily, why are you teaching the solar system? You know it's not developmentally appropriate to teach the solar system, the first and second graders. She says, it's in the curriculum, I got to teach it, right? Uh, so she does it in as uh, child-friendly, developmentally appropriate, cheery a way as a fashion as possible. You know, she does song and dance and she has the kids moving like the planets and uh, she teaches the kids the mnemonic device about remembering the order of the planets. Who remembers this? You know, my very excellent mother just served us nine pizzas. The first letter in each one of those words is the order of the planets, right? So she taught that the kids that mnemonic device, and the kids knew. The kids, uh, you know, learned all the moons of Jupiter. And there was a friend of my daughter's who's in this class named Linnea, and Linnea loves this, loved the solar system unit. And she could tell me, you know, I don't know all the names of the moons of Jupiter, but Linnea could tell me the names of the moons of Jupiter. And so I think, you know, maybe I'm wrong about this developmentally appropriate stuff. And so, uh, so the unit's over. Uh, we're, on, we're going on a, a, a vacation to the Caribbean. Uh, and it's my family and Linnea's family. And we're sitting on the plane, and I'm sitting behind Linnea and her mom. And Linnea leans over to her mother and says, Mommy, which planet is Mexico on? <laughs> <laughs> so which planet is Mexico on is a, is a good illustration of uh, not doing place-based education. So in first and second graders, I would contend uh, it's silly to teach them about the solar system because they don't have the cognitive structures in place to actually be able to understand you know, that the solar system, you know, there's the universe and the solar system, and then there's planets, and then there's continents, and, you know, that, that kind of, that kind of set inclusion thinking doesn't really exist yet for most first and second graders. Uh, and instead, we should be spending time in first and second grade with uh, understanding the school grounds and the neighborhood and the local community, uh, and then gradually build up, you know, by upper elementary grades or middle school to starting to deal with the solar system. So that's a one good example of not doing place-based education. Here's another one. This, is a, this is, comes out of my own education. So I'm taking a botany class when I'm about 25, and um, it's kind of a technical botany class. We're really kind of deeply engaged with using, uh, you know, Gray's uh, manual botany and uh, I'm in the midst of kind of ident you know all that kind of technical terminology about pistols and stamens and anthers and uh, and all of a sudden I get this image 
of this really big cross section of a flower that sat in the corner of the high school biology class that when I was in you know high school biology there it is it's like this big and it's you know a slice and half and it's got all and it's uh, it's you know it's a uh, the cross section of all the parts of the flower and I realized that when I was in high school my impression was that that diagram of a flower, that model of a flower, I thought represented some flower that existed in the Amazon. It was really big, you know, so it must have, it didn't really have any relationship to flowers that existed uh, outside the, you know, on the school grounds at my high school, right? It never occurred to me that there was a little relationship between the cross-section of the flower and flowers outside because there was, no back, there was no back and forth between inside school and outside school. Right? And so that was another example of the lack of place-based education. It was around that same time when I was uh, a naturalist for New Hampshire Audubon, working at a seacoast uh, uh, Audubon Center, and doing a lot of, and I was reading The Life and Death of the Salt Marsh, a great classic about salt marshes, and, and I'm doing a lot of naturalizing out in the salt marsh, and, all, and I had a similar kind of experience of like, oh, the pla that place that I used to go crabbing and play in the mud and run along the ditches and stuff, that was a salt marsh, right? Never, even, never occurred to me, you know, never was taken advantage of. And the local environments never played a role in the education that I had when I was growing up. Uh, so, <clears throat> this problem is nicely uh, stated in an article by a guy named Bill Bigelow uh, called How My Schooling Taught Me Contempt for the Earth. And he, was, he describes growing up uh, in Marin, north of San Francisco in the 1950s. Uh, and he says, I loved the land. I spent every after-school moment and every weekend or summer day outside until it got dark. I knew where to dig the best underground forts and how to avoid the toffee-like clay soil. I knew from long observation at nearby ponds the exact process of a polywog's transition into a frog. So he's talking about you know, all this kind of native experience and knowledge he had. And then he says, how did our schooling extend or suppress our naive earth knowledge and our love of place? Through silence about the earth and the native people, Bel Air Elementary School taught plenty. We actively learned to not think about the earth, about the place where we were. We could have been anywhere or nowhere. And whether it was in the study of history or writing or science or arithmetic, school erected a Berlin Wall between academics and the rest of our lives. The hills above the school were a virtual wilderness of grasslands and trees, but in six years, I can't recall a single field trip outside the door. Same kind of thing. So place-based education is a, um, is a response to the Berlin Wall that's been built between schools and the nearby environments and the communities. Now there's, you know, and there's a great green schools movement going on in the United States right now. I just spent uh, uh, earlier part today at the Denver Green School, where I'm going to talk about other examples. But in a lot of cases, uh, you know, there's this kind of Berlin Wall between schools and the and their surroundings. And so, place-based education is the antidote to this not thinking about the earth. And so, um, I want to give you a for instance of a, a nice piece of curriculum. Uh, to kind of get us started before I launch into more of the research piece. And so this is a nice farm to school curriculum in Guilford, Vermont. Guilford's in the southeastern corner of Vermont, and it's a town of about 2,000 people and a school, a K to 8 school with about 160 kids. Um, uh, uh, there's a fantastic farm to school movement going on in Vermont right now. I, I hazard to say that it's probably one of the better farm to school movements in the country with wonderful both connecting kids to local farms and local gardens but also really uh, school districts really working to get local uh, locally produced uh, farm goods into the school lunch programs in the schools so this uh, this is a nice little uh, three or four minute piece 
that comes from Jen Kramer's classroom when she was working with sixth graders about three or four years ago. built a sugar house yet, but maybe this year? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> we are producing a lot of maple syrup. They have produced a lot of maple syrup over the course of, of the last few years. And um, and are the sixth and the, the and this year the sixth graders are also starting a bread business, which is gonna be uh, so that they make they're gonna be making bread and certain and kind of and so they're gonna go through all those things that you know, all those questions about <laughs> Know, do we have permission to do this? The sixth graders are now going to be creating a bread business, and so they have to design the look, they have to design the packaging, they have to come up with a marketing plan, and that kind of stuff. So, lots of other kinds of things that are happening in the school. Uh, so, that's a that's a picture of uh, you know a, a good, for instance, a place-based education. So, we're going to broaden this a little bit and uh, start to look at some of the research about it. So we're going to be talking about uh, both, uh, basically, a place-based education as an alternative mindset for school improvement. You know, we've gotten stuck in the United States uh, with this mindset that the only way in which you can do school improvement, and school improvement really means raising test scores, the only way you can do school improvement is to uh, do direct <coughs> instruction. And direct instruction, you know, the time on task, seat time, you know, 90 minutes a day of literacy is the only way they're going to actually raise, you know, improve kids' reading skills and raise their test scores. Uh, so we're going to look at place-based education as an alternative approach towards raising test scores, but also look at it as, as uh, enlarging the uh, purpose and scope of what education really ought to be about. So schooling should be about academic achievement and making, you know, helping kids become smarter, but it should also be about uh, civic engagement and community improvement, it should have a larger purpose. It should really, in Dewey's terms, be a, a laboratory for democracy uh, and a laboratory for social activism. Uh, and we've kind of lost that kind of purpose. Uh, so about, I think it must be about 15 or 20 years ago at this point, uh, I was part of a, a focus group 
at the Moore Foundation. And the Moore Foundation was just starting at that point in uh, California, and they were going to fund environmental education in a really big way. And so they did a lot of study for about a year. Uh, and at the end of the year, they said, you know, we screen out things that are not measurable, and there are a lot of important things you can't measure, and we end up saying no to a lot of things that are important. For instance, after a year and a half of discussion, the foundation decided it would not make a big investment in environmental education for youth because it's not always clear if investments in environmental education results in ch changing a person's behavior. Uh, and so, you know, this was kind of like a gauntlet that got thrown down on the ground of like, well, there's not good, uh, you know, there's not good research that says an environmental education uh, really accomplishes what it says it's going to accomplish. So we created an evaluation agenda that uh, where we initially aspired to do three things. So we were going to look at the relationship between, uh, you know, in the beginning we started with environmental education, but that became enlarged to this concept of place-based education. Uh, look at the relationship between that and student achievement. Also look at the relationship between that and stewardship behavior. Because when you, you know, when you talk to environmental educators, they say, you know, what's the big idea here? Everybody says the big idea is that kids are going to grow up to be adults that, re that behave in environmentally responsible fashions. So that's what we mean by stewardship behavior. And that, uh, that also uh, we wanted to start to get at this idea of, uh, of improving environmental quality. You know, can environmental education actually have a measurable effect on improving the quality of the environment? So we decided we were going to do all those things. And then in the process of things, we got into looking at changes in teacher behavior and changes in school climate as well. And we created an evaluation collaborative that included a bunch of organizations in New England. Um, and then since that initial time, we've started to have other partners around the country. So the Appalachian Trail, the uh, Litzinger Road Ecology Center, which is part of the Missouri Botanical Garden, great program called Real School Gardens in Fort Worth. So we're trying to collaborate on doing evaluation of projects that are doing similar things around the country. So we have a, like a big radio telescope network of uh, projects to evaluate. And just so you get this understanding of uh, taxonomy, I think the big idea here is this idea of of you know, creating sustainable communities. And within that big, uh, uh, moving towards that big goal, you know, there's uh, developing regional food systems and there's figuring out how you maintain affordable housing and how do you keep locally owned businesses. And so place-based education is the education piece of this larger sustainable communities movement. And then within, uh, and so I like to think of place-based education as a paradigm you know, as a mindset rather than a specific kind of curriculum. Um, but then within place-based education, if a school is really using this paradigm, they're going to be doing agricultural education and service learning, and there will be environmental education as a part of it. But there's also going to be, you know, a focus on local and regional history and partnerships with community-based arts organizations. That PowerPoint that I just looked at, the music for that is done by, you know, local musicians playing music that has been an inherent part of the folk music tradition in southern Vermont, New Hampshire for the last couple of centuries. So, so you know, you want all these ways in which the character of the place shapes the curriculum and the approach in the school. And the big idea here is that, you know, authentic environmental and social commitment is going to emerge out of first-hand experiences with real places. Uh, over, you know, on a small manageable scale over time. So that means, you know, engaging kids with the local marsh and the flowers on the playground rather than with the solar system. This is just to give you a sense of some of these projects around the country. Real School Gardens is a, you know, a garden, uh, getting a garden in every school in Fort Worth and now in Dallas as well. Uh, this was a wonderful curriculum at the North Country School in the Adirondacks in New York, where the seventh grade math teacher was using, you can't really see this, that up in the upper right hand corner there, that's, those are the bills from the slaughterhouse. This math teacher got the bills from the slaughterhouse for the last 10 years because at the school, this school, they raise pigs, 
and then slaughter them, and then about, and then that meat goes into the school lunch, you know, into the into the food uh, service at this school. And so he got the bills over the last ten years, and was using the and was using analysis of the trends in the costs of the of slaughtering the pigs to teach out seventh grade algebra. Um, and then they were going to look at you know how much does it actually cost us to put a pork chop on the table, raising it ourselves versus how much does it cost to get it from the food service. And you know he knew that it was going to wind up costing more to get it from. Uh, to raise it locally, but then there were all the things about, you know, so is that an okay thing? Uh, example from Memphis, where the green team at the, in this uh, independent school in Memphis was working on creating models of what a greener Memphis would look like. So, uh, and then this wonderful example from this kind of little school in western Maryland, uh, which is basically right on the West Virginia border, so it's an old coal mining community, where uh, a fifth grade teacher uh, was running a summer science camp and found acid mine drainage kind of, kind of as part of the school grounds. And uh, they turned it into this opportunity to uh, create, an, uh, to basically mitigate the acid mine drainage, but also create an environmental education lab for the school, which uh, eventually led to them, the fifth graders winning a President's Environmental Youth Award. Uh, I'm going to talk about this school a little bit more later on. But this just gives you the sense of the diversity of kind of place-based education uh, things that are going on around the country. Here's another one from uh, Vinyl Haven, a school off the coast of Maine, where the teachers know that the kids are going to have to do a 35-minute writing prompt uh, on the Maine writing assessments. And so they create a writing prompt that's based on um, learning about Vinyl Haven uh, quarry history. So Vinyl Haven was a big quarry. It was grand, quarry granite was built all the big uh, federal buildings in a lot of the East Coast cities. Um, and so they created a writing prompt where the kids had to write about a quarry worker that was buried in the cemetery at the Historical Society. And then, it's, and then the story had to be set in one of the quarries on the island. So they're using the local, the learning about the local place, but then also having them practice for performance on the state writing assessments. So here's some examples. So if you if you do these kinds of things, what what are we finding out about it? This is a study from Washington State, uh, and the big finding was that students in schools using environmental education consistently score higher on standardized tests than students in schools without environmental education. They did. Uh, this woman did a, a, a paired, uh, she found 70 pairs of schools that were demographically similar. Um, so one school that was using environmental education or place-based education kind of as a school-wide approach versus a, a demographically similar school that was not doing that kind of approach. And so uh, paired schools where they were using an EIC approach versus not using an EIC approach, and then look at standardized test scores. <coughs> and the and the findings substantiated the earlier findings that in when they looked at test scores in language arts, math, social studies, and science, in 77 percent of the cases, the kids in the EIC schools were outperforming the schools, the non-EIC schools. It's also what you find is that uh, discipline. Uh, discipline problems go down in those uh, in the place-based education schools, and attendance goes up. Those are early those are early indicators of, of school change. Here's uh, this is some schools I worked with in Malden, which is near Boston. It's one of those inner-city schools with you know 26 different languages, and um, here's what the typical pattern was. These are the MCAS or the state curriculum test. So the yellow is the school, the school district averages, the green are the state averages, and the BB school, the school we were working with, is the red line. So the, the standard pattern was that the, the, the scores in this school uh, varied along with the state and district <coughs> averages. But after working with this school for three or four years, Oops. Yeah, this is what started to happen. So 
the BB school scores start out being basically equivalent with the district and the state, but then gradually start to diverge. That was in eighth grade life science, and then in you know, open response math questions, same kind of thing. The BB scores start out below the district and the, uh, and the state averages, and they exceed the district averages and become equivalent with the state averages. So there's lots of little case studies like this. Let's go back to that school in Maryland, uh, <clears throat> the one with the acid mine drainage. That school, over the last decade, has implemented uh, across the board comprehensive uh, place-based education programs uh, and lots of involvement with uh, community members. This is a high poverty school with about an 85 or 90 percent free and reduced lunch rate. Of the 874 ele elementary schools in Maryland, uh, this school had the highest pass rate on the Maryland state assess on the Maryland school assessments in 2010. And if you go back and you look at the pro their their uh, their test scores from 2003 when they started to 2010, you can see this gradual increase in their test scores. Uh, and so the Baltimore Sun article, the school seems to be a model of how a community can come together to see that children flourish. And it seems to be true for many of the top schools. Far from teaching to the test, that whole direct instruction mindset, these top schools are succeeding because they're interested in the whole child. And furthermore, they're interested in connecting the whole child to the community and the local environment. You know, there, uh, I was just at the Denver Green School today. Uh, They've only been, they've only been, uh, this is their third year, their test scores are uh, increasing. Uh, in uh, expeditionary learning schools, in which lots of expeditionary learning schools around the country, I think there's about 150 of them, use a place-based approach. They are finding, uh, you know, there's a school in Silverton, a school in uh, uh, Fort Collins. Uh, they are finding the same kinds of academic achievement improvements. And so over here on the left, we've got uh, the EL schools compared to district averages. And so it's showing that in uh, both in the elementary schools and the middle schools and the high schools, the expeditionary learning schools are, the kids in those schools are outperforming other schools in the same district. So you know, another example of this academic achievement thing. So here's the, um, here's the, the theory of change is that um, when you implement a comprehensive approach where it's, okay, we're gonna start to approach schooling differently in a school, what happens is that through professional development, you get changes in educator practice, you know, so that there's increased collaboration and there's more interdisciplinary focus and more project-based learning and more using the local environment. And that leads to increased student engagement and enthusiasm, and that should then lead to improved student academic achievement. This is kind of, this part gets a little wonky. Uh, so uh, we started to look at uh, the relationship between how much professional development, you know, so if you're trying to change a school, uh, you know, what, uh, you have to do professional development so the teachers start to do things differently. So we started to measure how uh, the amount of professional development and then look at the amount of change in the school. And so this was a, these are surveys that where we would you know, measure you know, how many summer institutes did you go to, how many uh, community learning center staff members did stuff in your classroom, uh, you know, how many quick informal meetings or conversations in the hallways did you have. Uh, so we, we're trying to measure all these different ways in which professional development happened for uh, teachers in schools. Uh, and then we started to, uh, then we looked at the relationship between uh, the amount of professional development, how much a school actually says, okay, we're really gonna commit ourselves to this and we're gonna do it thoroughly. And what we found was that uh, as, uh, as you increase the amount of professional development, you also increase the uh, dispositions for teachers to change and use the local environment and partner with local organizations and that kind of stuff. You know, so the, one of the things was educator use of local places changed from, you know, the from the first year of the program to the last year of the program. 
Uh, and then we kind of found this um, interesting phenomenon that after we worked with schools for a long period of time, there stopped being a relationship between the amount of professional development that a teacher had had and their and the amount of kind of place-based education that they did. So we couldn't figure out what was going on. And then we hypothesized that, in fact, uh, as, you, as you worked with a school over a long period of time, the, uh, the individual dose for the teacher, the amount of professional development that the teacher, each teacher was getting was going down. But what was happening was that the ch culture in the school, the whole school level dose, was changing so that the school's policies were changing, so that they were hiring new teachers on the basis of having this kind of disposition, or they were, uh, you know, kind of choosing uh, curriculum initiatives on the basis of how much it actually used community partners. And so we found that uh, the, the school culture, if you did this uh, conscientiously over three to five years, you could actually start to change the culture in a school. That was one of those little things that came out of, of the work that we were doing that we hadn't anticipated in the beginning. <coughs> And so we, so we had to bring in this notion that, in fact, the whole uh, professional development and increased student enthusiasm would actually change, uh, create changes in school culture that would then lead to improved student academic achievement. Okay, so that's the academic achievement piece. Um, how about uh, you know stewardship? Let's kind of broaden the notion here. It's not just about test scores. It's about actually changing students' behaviors. And what we, what we found through you know, questionnaires to students and to community members and to teachers was that uh, over the course of three to four years, we were getting reports of increased stewardship behavior on the part of kids. You know, yes, uh, you know, on my own, I uh, uh, participate in uh, community cleanups. Or on my own, I do something to help improve the quality of my neighborhood. Or uh, you know, I encourage my parents to take me uh, to, uh, to recycle at home. Those kinds of, we've, we've started to get increased reports of those kinds of behaviors in kids. And so this was, you know, this again was, here's some of the data from one of these schools we worked with in Maine, where progressively from one year to the next, the reports of student stewardship behavior increased. Here's a for instance, in Burlington, Vermont, this is a school, one of the few kind of uh, sustainability magnet schools in the country where um, they do a lot of uh, field trips in the neighborhood, identify a local problem, and figure out how to address that problem and implement solutions. In this one, the kids, uh, the students and teachers noticed that there were no, there were a, a dearth of school uh, uh, crossing uh, you know, those little zebra things that show where you're supposed to cross and a, and a lack of signs that indicated that there was a school zone for this one school. This was in a kind of a high poverty neighborhood in Burlington, Vermont. And so uh, they um, said, well, this isn't really fair. We should have these kinds of things in our neighborhood. It would be safer for school kids if we had the school signs. And so they then presented to the, uh, to the city council and then got the school signs implemented. And uh, the, you know, one of the teachers in the school said, now our students are very comfortable with business owners, with the mayor, with the city council, and with the neighborhood planning committee because they've spoken there. And when they go, people listen. And then a parent says, sustainability involves strengthening relationships between a community and a project such that eventually the project naturally happens on its own because the entire community is so invested. So what we're trying to, you know, trying to develop this facility or this disposition towards uh, stewardship behavior. In a school we worked with in Littleton, New Hampshire, uh, you know, we knew we were being successful when in our evaluation, uh, qualitative evaluation studies, the town manager said, there's not a town project I do where I don't first start with how can we involve the students. So that the town, the town officials started to see the school as a resource to solving local problems. Uh, this is the uh, transfer station manager. And uh, what happened was that Littleton uh, was trying to close its landfill. 
uh, and you know it costs a lot of money to close a landfill and for a number of years in a row the town would not vote to pass the bond issue to close the landfill. Uh, then they got eighth graders involved working with the engineering firm to do the public education on why you need to close the landfill and why it's important. And that year, the bond issue passed. And so the transfer station manager said thanks to the student presentations on why we need to close the landfill, the vote on the bond passed by one of the largest margins ever. And Littleton was identified around this time as one of those 10 most livable communities in the country and the school community partnerships were cited as one of those reasons. And then this was a study that Louise kind of uh, made me aware of. Um, it was actually done quite a, a while ago, but for um, four consecutive years, a teacher at a social studies a class in a high school involved his students in assisting the city planning commission to prepare a master plan. And there were other high school social studies classes uh, in which uh, uh, the teachers were not doing this. So you had both uh, high school, a whole bunch of social studies classes, one of which where the teacher was uh, using this approach, which was essentially a place-based approach. And then 30 years later, they looked, they compared alumni of the classes, these different classes, and they found that in the intervening 30 years, members of the planning project, the students were, that were in this one class, were four times more likely than non-members to have belonged to volunteer groups and twice as likely to have been officers in civic and service organizations. So in other words, if you give students the opportunity to practice civic engagement in school settings, you know, working on local issues and local problems, you can, you can actually develop a disposition to be civically engaged later in life. And go back to that school in Western Maryland. Uh, uh, the principal at this school says, you know, we've really opened up the school and taken the walls down so the whole community becomes the school. So go back to that thing I said in the beginning about, uh, you know, uh, creating a Berlin, schools creating a Berlin wall between school, between school and the rest of the community. So this is just the opposite. So when you, when you do it, when you take down that Berlin wall, you can change the, you can change schools and Okay. I gotta do this one. This is another, this gets a little wonky too. I guess it's good to get questions. Why don't we take a break for a second? Anybody have any comments or questions? Because this, I'm gonna do about 10 minutes more, and it gets a little, you know, gets a little heavy. So yeah. What's wonky? Wonky. Wonky. wonky is just where there's a, it's a lot of kind of technical data. So it's a little, it's sometimes a little hard to explain uh, simply, yeah. Okay, so the, remember I said three things. Student achievement, uh, stewardship behavior, and, and environmental quality. Right, so, um, <clears throat> so you talk to e the folks at EPA and they say, you know, we'd love to have some data that shows that environmental education can actually improve environmental quality, of which there really is, uh, up until starting about five to eight years ago, there was really no, nobody was really looking at that. And so, created another big partnership of organizations and got a, and funding from the EPA to look at the, see if there's a connection between place-based learning and environmental quality. So here was the starting point with the, of the idea. So this is uh, high school students in, in Montpelier, Vermont. Uh, you, get, you borrow the air quality uh, measurement equipment from the state, and you, you, know, you uh, monitor the air quality on the school grounds throughout the day. And what do you find? Is that the air quality tanks at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon if you're doing this outside, you know, outside on the school grounds. It's because you know, the air quality like plummets at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Hmm? Yeah, just because all the school buses are sitting outside idling bef you know, before they take kids home. And, um, and so this, big, this was part of a curriculum and then everybody, and then you know, the kids were learning, students were learning about, you know, about uh, air quality, the relationship between air, poor air quality and uh, you know, uh, air, you know, uh, 
air quality related diseases. And so um, it turned into a program where the students went to the school board, that turned into the students going to the legislature, that turned into legislation in Vermont to limit the, t the amount of time that school buses could sit idling in front of schools. Uh, and then that turned into the school nurse saying that there, were, uh, you know, a, there was a reduction in um, air quality related incidences reported to Turker after the policy was changed. And so this looks like, okay, here you've got you know, students taking action, making a difference, and then improving the quality of the environment. So we said there must be, so you know, there must be a bunch of other for instances of this around the country. And so we, we started out looking for a broad, we started out looking across the spectrum of things that you, of, of environmental indices, you know, uh, you know uh, biodiversity or water quality or air quality, but we found that there was, it was most likely to find uh, uh, programs that had actually done pre and post testing of air quality. So we, so we put out a request for uh, programs around the country that had done air quality, either air quality testing inside schools or air quality in the immediate environments of schools. Uh, so here was another, for instance, that we found of, uh, in Oregon, where they had, uh, they did air quality monitoring inside this uh, one, I think it was a, I think it was a, it was either a middle school or a high school. And they found that the air quality in one wing of the school was noticeably poorer than in the rest of the school. And then they then they went to the facilities guys and they presented this and then they checked and the and the uh, HVAC equipment was not working in that wing of the school, which they had not known before that. And then they fixed it and then it improved the air quality in that part of the school. So we found a bunch of examples where uh, you know. Students identified a problem, they worked with community partners, and then implemented a change which then had a measurable impact. So we looked at uh, you know, air quality, we looked at did a literature review, we found programs around the country, we did interviews with about 54 different air quality programs. Uh, and we found that about half of these programs had evidence of improvements in air quality. So students identified a problem, made it there was some kind of change, there was some improvement in air quality. So this is the one that's, this is it's a bad slide, it's got too much information on it. Uh, yeah, I'm not even going to try to explain it. Let's keep going. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we found that most of the study, most of the program study took some form of action to promote air quality improvement. And so here's the, here again, here's the, the assumed uh, theory of change. There's some kind of uh, place-based learning or educational intervention where uh, you, know, you start, you study air quality in the classroom, uh, you study uh, you know, air quality, and that leads to some measurement, environmental quality measurement, which leads to some action based on the findings, which leads to some change in policy or change in behavior or change in the facilities which then leads to a documented environmental quality improvement. So that's the, this is the kind of the sequence of steps that we were finding was happening in these successful programs. And then we found that the programs that were doing, that had more components of place-based learning in them were the programs that were more likely to show a change in air quality. Okay. So we said, we looked at all these programs, and we found that the programs that were the successful ones were the ones that included a service learning component. They contributed to authentic community needs. They were supported by school leadership. They utilized or existed new, uh, they utilized or created uh, local partnerships. They were experiential or hands-on. So in other words, the things, the programs that had elements of place-based education were the ones that were more likely to lead to measurable change in air quality. And so we were able to say that yes, education programs can uh, lead to measurable improvements in air quality, 
and that place-based education practices were the strongest predictors of the ability to make uh, change. Uh, and the last one, it's possible to quantify a relationship between education and environmental quality. EPA loved this, you know, because they said, oh, okay, here's a, here's a, for instance, and this was the beginning of a methodology for kind of making these kinds of things. I'm going to skip that one. So to wrap things up, uh, if, you, if you get interested in this stuff, uh, this is a, uh, this is a PowerPoint that's available online that summarize that I've kind of taken little pieces of it, uh, and it's uh, you know summarizes a lot of these studies that were done up until about uh, this was even old now at this point uh, six or seven years ago, but it was a summary of a lot of the studies at that point. Uh, this is a report that's at this website of the place-based education evaluation collaborative that talks about all the stuff that I've been talking about in terms of the impacts of place-based education in schools. This is a piece that Louise did uh, here on, it's, this, is, this is the perfect thing to give to, this is the kind of thing you give to the principals or the superintendents, you know, that say, well, we can't do this kind of stuff because we're a low-performing school. So it's a beautiful, it's a nice little synoptic two-page, easy to digest for carried administrators kind of piece that talks about all these kinds of things. And then to summarize, you know, if you do curriculum that connects school, place, and community, uh, test scores can improve, students can become stewards, and you can get measurable change in environmental quality in the season. That's it.